So it's my pleasure to introduce um, one of our keynote speakers, uh, Melissa Jordan. Um, so that means that Melissa has a bit of a longer talk um, to give us today, which is fantastic. So Melissa um, is from the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research in Auckland in New Zealand, where she's in the molecular sensing team. Um, and she's going to talk to us today about um, a really interesting topic, uh, the origins of insect olfaction. So Melissa, um, over to you. Thanks, Carl. Let's share my screen. Okay, so kia ora koutou and um, hello everyone. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank the organisers for giving us all of the opportunity to speak at this great symposium. It's really nice to have the opportunity to share our knowledge and our research with um, all like-minded researchers out there um, involved in insect taste and olfaction. So today I'm going to talk to you about the origins of insect olfaction. Um, and in order to do this, we need to go back in time. And um, not back a little way, back quite a, quite, quite a long way. We're talking about 485 million years ago. And at this time, all of life lived in the water. And if you think about this in a chemosensory, in a chemosensory sense, um, these organisms were detecting compounds that were dissolved in the water, mostly hydrophilic compounds. But there was a tenacious little group of organisms that decided that they didn't want to live in the water anymore. They thought that living on land, they'd, li they'd like to have a go at living on land. And these were the ancestors of the hexapoda, the, the modern hexapoda that we know today. And so, as you can imagine, when these organisms decided to move on to make the tr transition from the water to the land, this brought about whole new de demands on the olfactory system. So they all of a sudden had to be dealing with these, um, these compounds that were in the air, um, were hydrophobic, and um, were at longer distances. And not only that, but a few million years later, these, uh, a group of these insects then decided to take flight. And this brought about another a, a whole new demand on the insect olfactory system. Suddenly they were having to detect um, compounds on the wing. They were having to fly through uh, various concentrations of odorants and having to suddenly have the system that was much faster and much more sensitive to be able to detect uh, compounds that were from further away and that were fluctuating. So let's return back to the current um, time, time and um, think about how is it that insects smell. Now we're all somewhat experts in this, so I, um, I just wanted to quickly go over the three different uh, chemoreceptor gene families that insects use for olfaction or to, to detect chem chemicals. So the first one are the IRs. These are very ancient um, lineage of receptors related to the inotropic glutamate receptors. Um, and they, are, they mainly detect hydroph hydrophilic ligands. Then we have the GRs. These are um, a group of seven transmembrane proteins which are unrelated to GPCRs. And again, this is quite an old lineage. Um, and they work in, uh, in, in a, in, together um, with various um, uh, stoichiometries of different GRs and they uh, taste mainly, sorry, they detect mainly tastants, but also CO2. And then we come to the ORs. These are a group of um, receptors that are related to the GRs. They are insect specific. They work together as a complex with the essential co-receptor ORCO and a ligand binding OR. And these, uh, these detect the hydrophobic volatile odorants in the air. But the question is, where did these OAs come from? When did they arise? Did they evolve with this transition to land or did they evolve with the um, advent of flight? So um, we started thinking about this um, and uh, Hugh Robertson and, and his group um, back in the early 2000s, sorry, started thinking about this. And uh, what they found was when they looked at the relationship of chemosensory receptors 
in, in Drosophila, they found a clear separation of the gustatory receptors and the odin receptors. But always at the very base of the odin receptor clade was ORCO. And this, um, they started to hypothesize that potentially ORCO was a remnant of one of the first expansions of odin receptors or potentially was uh, the, one of the, um, the first odin receptors that evolved in, in, in insects. But, um, but, and this is also uh, something that is seen for all neopteran uh, insects, the higher insects. But what about um, some of the basal insects, some of the insects that are found lower down in the phylogenetic tree? So some research that went on started looking at um, the odent receptors in some of these more basal insects. So if we start from, work our way down the, the, uh, down the phylogeny, um, we find that um, when we look at the paleoptera, the, uh, the dragonflies and the mayflies, they actually have uh, an orco present and they have, um, for the uh, mayflies, they have a number of ORs. So it seems like these um, insects do have a, what we call a normal olfactory system. Again, the odonata, um, the, the damselflies and, uh, and uh, dragonflies have an orco and a much reduced number of, of ORs, potentially due to their, their um, overriding visual system. Then we move down to the zygentoma, the, the silverfish, and, uh, and the firebrats. And what we find here is, again, they have an orco and many ORs. So it seems like they also potentially have a normal olfactory system. And then when we move down a little bit further to the archegnath, the bristletails, something really interesting comes up. And we find that these insects have, uh, have what we call ORs, sorry, but um, they don't seem to have an orco. So this is very interesting. So um, there's a limited number of, of genomes um, available for these basal insects. And we decided that um, we'd like to try and help to fill in some of the gaps. And we, we started a project called What Was the First Smell? And during this project, we, did, we wanted to um, sequence the genomes and transcriptomes of more of these basal hexapods. So during this time, we uh, did some genome and transcriptome sequencing from more species from the zygentoma, from the odonata, from the ephemeroptera, and from the archaeognaths. And what we found was very similar to what had already been found um, previously, that the zygentoma, the silverfish, do seem to have an orco and, and multiple ORs. Again, the, the dragonfly has, has an orco and a, a very much reduced number of ORs. And the mayfly, again, has an orco and a number of ORs. And I've got here question marks because this, uh, this bristle tail is currently under analysis. We've only just done the, the transcriptome. So we will um, update that once we have the, the information. So now we, we, we've got all of these receptors that are coming from these basal insects. What do they look like? What's interesting about them? Well, what we find is that when you, uh, when you look, at the, um, test, look at these receptors uh, in databases, they always come back with the best blast hit to ORCO. And we find that there's often well above um, a 15% sequence identity with ORCO. So normally we see sort of between 10 and 15% is typical for these neopteran, the higher insect ORs, but there's much higher sequence identity with ORCO with these basal ORs. Um, and they're especially conserved uh, with regards to ORCO at the C-terminal region, which has been shown, as we know, to be important for ORCO function. And I've just got a, a, an example here where I have an alignment of um, a number of neopteran ORs at the top here some of the basal ORs from um, the different insect orders, and then two orcos at the bottom here. And you can kind of clearly see at the, at the end, at this um, three prime end, that there's a much higher amount of homology between the basal insect ORs compared to the, um, the neopteran ORs and orco. And in fact, what we see is that when you look at um, the, the percentage identity of amino acids between orcos and orcos, they're generally above 50%. When you look at um, 
the neoptrin ORs, as I said before, they're generally between 10 and 15%. Whereas when we look at our basal ORs compared to ORCOs, this, um, this increases to up to sort of around 33%. So I just wanted to take a little sidestep and talk about the birth and uh, how ORs evolve. So basically, um, ORs follow the birth and death evolution model. They expand uh, by duplication, uh, gene duplication, and then over time you get um, uh, new functions, new functions arising, and also they they die off if they don't have a use. And so this is called pseudogenization. So basically what you find is that um, for ORs, you get these lineage um, or these species-specific expansions and contractions and a mixing of ORs between different insect orders of the, of the neopteran insects um, that don't really follow the, the order phylogeny. And you get this because of you of the orthologs and paralogs that you get in these in these insects. So a real mixing of the ORs. Now, when you start to bring in the basal ORs into this into this mix, this is what we find. So this is a maximum likelihood tree where we have included um, a, a whole lot of neoptrin ORs from all the different insect orders, and in, that's in, in the sort of light aqua color. And then in grey, we have the GRs. And then we also have all of the basal um, ORs that we have available at the moment. And what we find here is that um, we still see this separation between the GRs and all of the ORs. So the ORs are monophyletic compared to the GRs, as we expect. And what we also find mixing between the neoptrin ORs here in Aqua and the basal ORs. So there's, there's, we don't see this, um, this birth, this, sorry, this um, mixing of ORs um, between the two, um, the two different um, insect um, subclades, which is interesting. So um, what I want to do now is to get a close up view of, of what's going on here in the, um, with the basal ORs. So I've, here I've just um, collapsed the, the GRs and the neoptrin ORs, so you can get a better view of what's happening with the, uh, all of the ORs from the basal insects. So the first thing to note is that here we have in black the orcos. And what we find is that orcos, as we expect, um, show this divergent evolution, whereby they follow the insect phylogeny uh, by orders. So we start with the, the basal ORs, sorry, the basal insects going right through to the neoptrin insects. So this is what we expect, and, um, and this kind of tells us that um, we're, we're this, our phylogeny makes sense. And then what we find is that um, the zygentoma, the, the, sorry, the silverfish, um, and the fire brat seem to have this extended orco clade, which is um, closely related to orcos, but, uh, but are not actually functioning or not actually orcos. And then we have um, a clade which is separate for the, for the paleoptera, the, which is the dragonflies, the mayflies, and the damselflies. And then the other interesting thing we find is that for the neoptrin, sorry, for the ephemeropter, the mayflies, they split into three different, um, three different clades. And in fact, the, the, the mayflies and the silverfish all have a, um, a clade that relates to the, that, that is more closely associated with the neoptrin ORs. And they also have a clade of, of ORs that is more closely associated with the GRs. And, and also a, a kind of a clade in the middle here. So this is, um, this is really interesting. And we, what we're finding, what, what, what this kind of is telling us is that um, conversely to what was first thought, ORCO does not seem to be the first, uh, the, the first kind of OR that comes out in the evolutionary tree. In fact, there are a, um, a whole load of, of receptors 
here in these basal insects, um, including the bristletail oars, that seem to be um, seem to have have come out um, earlier than the orco um, orco gene. So this led us, sorry, this this led us to um, propose a a multi-step evolutionary scenario for these ORs. What we think happened is that um, at terrestrialization, when these, these organisms moved onto, the, onto land, they had a, a, a primitive OR system. Um, sorry, what I forgot to mention here is that these, um, these ORs, we feel because they are uh, below the orco in, in the evolution tree, it is likely that they are actually working um, without orco in, in the complex. And so we find that what, we've, what we uh, felt is that um, these primitive ORs um, have, have evolved um, at terrestrialization and they are a system that um, potentially works without orco. And then at the time of flight, um, the, when the olfactory system had this need for a much faster and much more sensitive system, um, that's when ORCO was, uh, became evolved to, to have the, um, the role of a co-receptor and um, work together in concert with an OR, ORX, a ligand binding OR. But the interesting thing is that we find that even after this transition to flight, the ephemeroptera and the zygentoma seem to have remnants of this, of this original primitive OR system. And the nice thing is that recently there's been some evidence to show that this is actually true. So a recent paper that came out from Vanessa Ruta's lab has shown that um, they looked at the function and the structure of the two of the bristletail ORs, and they are right at the very bottom of the, of the tree. And they found that um, these, or particularly these um, ORs can form homomeric tetramers and that the, um, the bristletail OR5 is actually quite a broadly tuned receptor in it, and it works as a, as a receptor in a homomeric state. So this is really nice evidence starting to come out that potentially this system is, is, is real and is, is true. So um, another little side um, thing I wanted to talk about is that we noticed that uh, in the mayflies that they have these three clades of receptors. And the other interesting thing about mayflies is that they also have three different life stages and they range from an aquatic lifestyle through to a ter terrestrial lifestyle. So we were really interested to know whether these different lifestyles could be using these receptors in different ways would they show differential expression of these different receptor clades or, um, over their different life stages? So we tested 22 ORs with PCR to look at their expression in the different life stages, which include nymph, subimago, and imago. And what we found is that ORCO is expressed in all three life stages, and that in the nymph, um, they, you can see they have evidence of receptors from the neopterin clade and from this, this middle clade here. But they don't seem to have, from the ones that we tested, any evidence of um, receptors from this GR clade, this GR associated clade. Whereas in the subimago, um, we, we saw evidence for um, receptors from this middle clade and from the GR clade, but not from the neopterin clade. And in the imago, um, at this point, we haven't seen any evidence of any of the receptors. However, um, the tissue is very hard to, to work with and um, we need to do some more work on, on this one. So unfortunately, there wasn't any clear difference between, majorly clear difference between um, the different life stages and the types of receptors that they express. But we will continue to do work around this and, um, and look further into it. So the other question we had is that now we have these um, evidence of these expressed receptors. Um, are they functional? Can, you know, do these insects actually use their, their olfactory system to smell? And so we um, decided to look at how, um, whether the orcos 
uh, function as normal ORCOs. And to do this, we screened the ORCOs in an um, inducible HEC293 cell-based assay system. And we generated ORCO cell lines for three different um, species and tested with the VUAA1 agonist. So what we did um, was tested ORCOs from the Thermobia domestica, the firebrat, from one of the mayflies and from a dragonfly. And here on the top you can see a um, response from the Drosophila orco. This is what we normally get in our assays with VUA1 um, dose response. Um, a really, really good response to VUA1. What we found with um, the firebrat was that it did respond to VUA1, but it was much reduced in its, um, its level of um, its amplitude of, 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 um, uh, of response. And unfortunately, we didn't see any response in the mayfly orco. Um, however, um, a caveat to that is that we worked with the protein sequence um, that is publicly available, and we didn't have the nucleotide sequence at the time. Um, so we may, you know, there may be a small things wrong there. Um, when we looked at the, the dragonfly orco, we found that um, there was a response at very high concentrations but it was um, somewhat insensitive to the VUA1, and this is quite similar to what was seen for the Hessian fly. So the next step was, um, okay, we have these orcos that seem to be um, behaving like an orco. Can we see if they couple to a, an odin receptor, a ligand-binding odin receptor? So for this Five one, we... Left. Thanks. So for this one, we um, co-expressed a Drosophila uh, ligand binding receptor, OR59A. Again, in the three different um, ORCO cell lines. And what we found was that, yes, they can actually couple to this um, ODIN receptor. Um, again, a very much reduced response compared to what you'd normally see with, um, with the Drosophila ORCO and the Drosophila um, uh, ligand binding receptor. However, we do get dose responses in the, um, in the firebrat and also dose responses in the dragonfly. So this is showing us that um, the orcos that they have are functioning as um, a, uh, a functional unit that can couple to an odin receptor and, um, and work as you would expect for an um, a olfactory complex ion channel. So um, I just wanted to kind of finish by saying um, some of these differences that we see in how these orcos work uh, are, are no doubt down to the fact that these orcos do look quite different. Um, when you start to look at the sequence identity between these um, orcos, you find that uh, that with with the as you expect with neoptin orcos. Um, comparison to each other, you get these really high sequence identities uh, between 60 and, and up to 90 kind of percent sometimes. However, when you look at the paleoptera, the, the dragonflies and um, damselflies and mayflies, you get much, much lower sequence identity with the orcos compared to the neoptin orcos. And again, with the zygentome and the silverfish firebrat, um, a much lower percentage identity. So there's many, many places where these orcos are, are, are varied and um, can have an effect on how they, how they work as, as orcos. But I just wanted to bring up two, um, two areas that are of interest. One is around the calmodulin binding site towards the three prime end. There is really quite a lot of change at this site for, the, um, for many of the basal insects. And again, around, um, around this area where um, some of these residues are really important in the, um, the function of ORCO, which was, has come out from these, these last couple of papers um, talking about the ORCO structure and function from Vanessa Ruta's lab. So these will be really interesting things to look into um, in the future. Two minutes so, left. In summary, um, the odin receptor gene, multi-gene family in, in insects likely evolved from gustatory receptors. 
Um, basal and sector vary in their number of ORs and their expression profile is consistent with a role in olfaction. The early expansion patterns of the OR multigene family suggest a multi-step evolutionary scenario leading to the origin of the derived ORCO and OOX system in the, in the neoptrin insects that we see today. Um, and there are remnants of an ancestral ORCO-independent chemosensory system that are present in Archegnath, and we can see evidence of this actually being true now. And we think that this may also be there in Zygentoma and even in, um, in mayflies. But we really don't know how they use these two different systems when they have both available. And we've found that basal insect orcos are able to form a functional olfactory unit. And just to finish, I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved in this, uh, in this research, particularly to Michael Toma, who was a, a postdoc, visiting postdoc with us and did all the work on the digentoma, or the, the silverfish, and Shredevi, our PhD student, who has done all the work on the mayfly and everyone else involved in it. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. That was incredibly fascinating. So I really enjoyed it. Um, have we got questions? And again, just a reminder, if you've recently joined, you need to put your questions in the Q&A. And if you're on the panel, you can either write it in the chat or you can just put your hand up, uh, whichever you would prefer. Um, so do we have some questions for Melissa? All right, I'm not seeing any. It does take a minute or two. We have found a lag in the Q&A, so if you do put one in and I don't get to it quite promptly, that's why. Um, I might just start, Melissa. So do you see, I guess, value or interest in doing this same sort of analysis with the IR family? Um, in terms of those major life stage transitions, do you know what I mean? Right. Um, the land, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Is it equally likely or less likely that they are involved? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because obviously the IRs really are, um, uh, as we know, are um, involved more in the hydrophilic um, detection. And so they may as we uh, potentially have more of a role in these uh, these life stages that are involved in water um, so it's a lot of the nymphs which which grow up in in water environments um, are more likely to use irs in their in their olfactory or in their chemosensing i imagine um, but whether or not and whether or not they would lose that over their life stage um, I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to look at. And I think, you know, we are we are also pulling out the IRs from these transcriptomes, but we just haven't quite finished all of that work yet. So we will definitely be looking into um, whether there are any changes in the numbers of IRs that are expressed um, over the different life stages and, and over the different insect orders as well. I have a question here in the Q&A from Adele, although I might, I might have to ask for more information, but let's see how we go. I would like to inform you that we have found an OR that works without ORCO in, in, in a neopteran insect. Could you please explain about that this issue? <laughs> I guess it depends what system they're using. Um, I think that would probably be a big um, question for me, uh, depending on the type of system that you're looking, that, that you're doing functional work in, and I guess uh, that could that could be, it could be an explanation as to how that could work, because I guess now that we see um, the work that's come out of Vanessa Ruta's lab about how these ORs interact, and there's a very small section of them that actually is there interacting within the membrane, uh, it's, it's potential it's potentially possible that some of these ORs out there are able to still form these homomeric um, complexes and work as ion channels. We don't, I, mean, I guess we don't, we don't know, but I think it would depend a little bit on the system that they're using. Yeah, so Adele has, has added um, in Xenophus right. Russian system. <clears throat> okay, okay, right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I haven't heard of that before, obviously, so um, it would be an interesting thing to look into. I'm not sure at this stage. 
Yeah, I, I guess it's also around, yeah, there are the various heterologous expression systems and how well they are replicating the in vivo situation is always, exactly. is always the question. Yeah. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Um, Jason, you wanted to ask a question? Yes, thank you, Carl. Um, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, I've, Jason. I've been interested for a long time in the evolution of odoreceptors in insects, so your work here is really, really fascinating and elucidating some of these principles. I guess I've often wondered about the model for birth and death evolution as a broad principle across insect lineages. Why is it that we don't see more pseudogenes or remnants of odor receptors in the genomes of insects? Many, there, there are some out there certainly, but for many of these insects, we just don't see them. So if these are such rapidly evolving, rapidly duplicating genes, one ought to predict that there would be more pseudogenes, genes that even just have stop codons or um, what have you in them. And, and they're just not there by and large. Could you offer some explanation or mechanistic explanation for why that might be the case? If you have any thoughts, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I've, probably, I've had the same thoughts, to be fair. Um, uh, I've, I've done a lot of thinking, especially around the uh, the the odonata because they have this this reduced number of ors and and to be fair we don't see pseudogenes we don't find them i just don't see any evidence in it it's 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 really interesting and i don't know at this point why that is um and uh, not being enough of an evolutionary biologist to know exactly how much time you actually need to lose a a gene completely i mean um, we're talking, we're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of years here. Um, so, is that enough time to have lost many of the things that just aren't useful for these for these insects? Um, and it's it's an interesting question. I'm not exactly sure if I can answer it at this stage, but it's it's something that I've pondered as well, especially around the odonata. The other interesting thing that I will say is that um, with those three different uh, clades of of receptor, basal odorant receptors that we see, um, we often find more pseudogenization in the GR clade. Um, so there's often more pseudogenes uh, associated with that, which could be an indicator that um, this is a clade that is a remnant and it is no longer being used as much. And so that's potentially why we see a few more um, pseudogenes uh, you know, associated with that clade of receptors. But um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. <laughs> I've got a couple of other follow-ups from Adele, but let's just see if anyone else has got a question before we go back to that one. So the follow-ups about the OR that works without ORCO in Xenopus um, are yeah. that it clusters with basal ORs in a tree and mm. that it shows a different response profile um, with ORCO when expressed with ORCO. <laughs> okay, that's really interesting. I guess it would be really quite interesting to have more of a discussion about that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to suggest to Del that you email Melissa, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be really good. Yeah, I'd like to have a discussion about that with you for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's the best way because unfortunately we can't provide audio audio for a <clears throat> yeah oh thank you any other questions anyone would like to ask another minute we've got one here from um richard newcomb if the genes are tandemly arrayed then it's relatively quick to lose genes by unequal crossing over i'm oh, sorry that's an answer to the previous one right <clears throat> okay <laughs> thanks richard <laughs> <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Melissa. I uh, really enjoyed that yeah. presentation and thanks for being one of our keynote speakers. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity. No problem. All right. So let's just introduce the next speaker, um, who I can see is ready to go. Um, so our next speaker is um, Chen Zhu Wang. Uh, Chen Zhu is based in um, the Institute for Zoology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, so Chen Zhu um, is going to talk to us about a gustatory receptor 
Tim de Sinegren, and I was, I was just sitting here thinking that we've been a bit olfaction focused for quite a while, so it's great that we're going to hear about a gustatory receptor. So take us away, Chen Zhu. <laughs> Hello, Carl, everyone. I'm Chen Zhu Wang from the Institute of Zoology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. The title of my presentation today is a gustatory receptor tuned to synegrin in a cabbage butterfly, Pieris ripa. Glucosinolates is a specific group of secondary plant metabolites, mainly distribute, distributed in cruciferous plants. They are used as token stimuli by many specialist insects, such as Pieris ripi. This phenomenon was first reported by the Versa field in 1910. This paper is generally considered to be the beginning of the study of insect plant research. In 1967, Saul Hoven disco discovered that the two sensilla stiliconica on the delay of the each maxilla in caterpillar of the Pieris brassica respond to the, a number of glucose analysis. In 1995, Stadler and uh, Remick and others found the two group of, uh, two group of uh, sensilla also exist in a classy of the foreleg of the Pieris uh, reply. These two group of sensilla also respond, respond to the glucosinides. The, this photo was taken in Wageningen in 1998 when I visited Professor Song uh, At that time, we are curious about the coding mechanism of these butterflies to glucosinides. But up to now, which Thus, tetri receptors are tuned to the glucosinolysis remains unknown. Several kind of receptors are involved in the test perceptions, GR, IR, PRP, and uh, some uh, PPK, and so on. But the GR play a central role in this process. Based on the GR's function, they can divide into three groups of uh, receptors. Carbon dioxide receptors, sugar receptor, and the beta receptor. Among them, the beta receptor uh, play a key role in recognition of plant secondary compounds. At present, most of the current knowledge about the insect beta receptors come from study of the Drosophila melanogaster. It has been shown that the one compound active, activates multiple neurons, and one neuron also responds to many beta chemicals. GR combinations are highly variable to different testants. Response of the GRNs in different sensilla can be shifted through expression or deletion of the GRs. Only a few beta receptors have been found, in, uh, have, have been functionally characterized in other insects, such as uh, swallowtail butterfly. Uh, uh, silk moth uh, and the Protella uh, Casillostella. P. 
Pierre three pi is a worldwide pest in cruise, in cruise for, uh, plants. The cabbage is its a f most favorite host plant. Here is the glucose analysis exists in the cabbage based on their sod chain can be classified as three groups, aliphatic, endonic, and uh, aromatic. We select five of them. They are the semigrain, gluconapi, glucoiberin, glucoprocessing, gluconasturtin uh, used in our experiment. First, we carry out the behavioral response of the Pierre's Ripalawi to the five glucose analytes. Uh, we use a just a very simple choice test. The painting, paint the glucose analytes into, into the copy leaves and see what's the insect uh, the behavior. From here, you can see that, uh, that all the five, five glucose have a very strong uh, stimulate, stimulating effect to the larval feeding. So the, the, uh, the glucoprocessing is the best one. Uh, and all the other three are all, all the other, all, uh, but uh, here there are special, uh, special cases that the glucoiberin, yeah, uh, it has a stimulating effect only at the 0 0.1 millimolar. Then we started the test response of Sensilla conica of larvae to this glucose analysis. Here we can see the two Sensilla in the larvae. One is the lateral Sensilla conica, this one, and the medial Sensilla conica here. We can find that in the lateral Sensilla conica, uh, this sensilla responds to all the five, five steloconic, uh, uh, all the five glucose analysis. But in the medial sensilla, there's the one neuron just to respond to the glucose processing. Here is the dose response curve. We also studied the responses of the test sensilla in periods female and the males to glucose analysis. Here are the females, four leg, tarsi. Also have the two, here is a two group of uh, sensilla. One is the lateral tarsal sensilla and the medial tarsal sensilla. You can find that in the lateral tarsal sensilla, uh, there's a re response to the glucoprocessing and the glucosinastertine. But in the medial sensilla, there's a response to the all the five glucose analysis. Here are the dose response curve. Response of the test sensilla in, in the female in the males is just uh, similar to the female to that of the female. Based on the above results, we have reason to speculate that the receptor due to the glucose analysis in the foreleg tarsi of the adults and the, and the mouse parts of the larvae have a relatively high expression level. Then we carry out the transcriptome analysis of female and male tarsi at the mouse part of larvae, we got 33 putative GRs. Based on the TPM value of the GR in adult tarsi, the most abundantly expressed GR 
is a GR22. They further validate the res result with the qPCR. In fact, that's the, the, the highly expressed, uh, expressed uh, GRs uh, is the GR28. GR22 is, uh, is, is just in the middle. But the second is the GR15. So then we focused our research on GR28 and the GR15.5. Five minutes left. Okay. So we use a Xenopos system to study its function of this these two GR at their combination. From here, we can find that the GR28 is specifically respond to the synegrin, not to the other chemicals tested. This is uh, under the, under the, the one millimolar uh, concentration. And the GR55 have no response to any of the stimuli, and also the mixture of the GR28 and the 15 also have no, but here is a clear dorsal response, but uh, it's weaker than the response of the single 20, 28. So then we use the in situ hat direction, try to know if these two receptor is co-expressed in the foreleg. Tasi. We actually detect the expression of the GR28, but, but fail to detect the GR15 in there. Then we use a, a Josephila expressing system to epitopically express them in the sweet neurons. Uh, this sweet neuron is, a, is a expressing the GR5A. Now we use the GAL4 UAS system to express the GR28. Uh, then got the uh, homoracle. Then use the single sensilum recording, uh, tip recording to study uh, the, the electrophysiology and the behavior. Here shows uh, we actually express the GR28 in these neurons. Before we test the glucosinolysis, synolysis, we first test with the sucrose to make sure we, we get the right uh, neuron. Uh, this neuron is we call uh, this neuron expressed in the, uh, this neuron is located in the, in the large, uh, largest sensilla in the lab, lab lab. So then we test with the glucosinolysis. We find that the neuron expressed the GR28 only is response to the synegrin here, not to, not to other four glucosinolysis. Here are the uh, dorsal response. From here, you can see that uh, that when we use a two choice test, the presence, presence of the GR28 in the sweet neuron reduces the aversive effect of synegrin to flies. Finally, two minutes left. Okay. Finally, we use the RI to further test the effectiveness of knockdown of the GR28. We set up three DSRIs treated groups. That is, uh, that is the GR28A uh, DSRI, B DSRI, and uh, A and B DSRI, and in, inject in the larvae, then detect, detect their electrophysiological response in the medial sensilla in the uh, in a tarsal, uh, in a tarsal, tarsal medial sensilla. From here, 
you can find the, that the really that the that the that online is, is effective, reduce expression of the GR28. Here is a is a is an electrophysiological re, uh, results. You can hear from the the response to the cinegram it reduce. It's it, it's worth noting that uh, that uh, the response to the gluconapping is also reduced here. So here is a is a is a is a same route. Here is a dorsal response. Can you, we need to finish up now if we can? Okay. Excellent. So conclusion. <laughs> okay. Okay. Finally, I want to thank my postdoc Yang Jun and all the other uh, all other colleagues and. Uh, uh, and my friends involved in this study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chen Zhu. That was really, really beautiful work. Um, lots and lots of different approaches used to analyze that. Um, do we have any questions either from the panel members or from the attendees? Remembering panel members. Um, Chen Zhu, could I ask you to stop sharing your slides for me? Yeah, I try, but... To <laughs> I can I can do it for you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You <laughs> okay. Um, okay. All good. Any questions from anyone? The way has a question. Way, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. With work, Sinju. Uh, yeah. Um, so my question is, did you have a chance to check other insects? For example, diamond back moss, does it have similar gastric receptor to respond to this compound? Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, in this study, we just focused on the Pierre Ripi. So we share this data to our collaborator in the Wageningen University. They are focused on the study in the Pieris brassicae. So I send the send the sequence of the of the GRs. Yeah, for example, the GR twenty eight. They also find these these genes in the brassica uh, in the brassica, also in a very high expression level. We also check these genes expression in the Plutella, but we, we didn't find the homologs of these genes. So it's clear that uh, there's uh, another story in the Plutella. So now we are still working on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Chen Zhu? I'll just give the attendees a second. <clears throat> um, so Nobuaki, why would you like to ask your question? Okay, thanks. Uh, why didn't you knock out the receptor but reduce the expression level of R uh, or GR? You mean the knock knocking off? Right? Knock out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we have a hard time to do this because uh, this butterfly is, uh, is very difficult to rear uh, in the laboratory. If we use a uh, CRISPR Cas9, Cas9, we should get the uh, three, uh, three generations and uh, this insect need a very large room to rear in them. So anyway, I think this could be done in the future when we solve this problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so I think we might um, move on to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Chen Zhu. Um, and I'm really glad that, that Zoom worked well for you. Um, <clears throat> all right, so our next speaker, I just introduce.
uh, is um, a PhD student. Uh, um, I'm going to butcher your name, Anna Ruda. I'm positive, but anyway. <laughs> um, Anna yeah. Ruda yeah. Uh, works with Wei at Murdoch University, um, and he's going to talk to us about um, refolding of insect over and binding proteins. Um, so over to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, um, I'm Anirudh Dagnyotri. Originally, I'm from India. You can call me Annie. Currently, I'm almost about to finish my PhD in Dr. Wei's lab in Murdoch University. Uh, this presentation is based on my PhD work, uh, which was all about odor and binding proteins of Helicorp armigera and their functional and structural characterization. Uh, uh, the small part of it, I'm going to present it today, and uh, the title of it is Unfolding the Truth uh, Behind the Refolding of Insect Odor and Binding Proteins. So just a brief introduction to what exactly these OVPs are and what exactly these OVPs do inside the insect chemosensory system. Uh, if we consider an insect chemosensory system and take an example of antenna, we, there are small projection on this antenna, which are called as sensillas. And inside this sensilla, there are sensory neurons uh, and which are surrounded by sensory lymph. So these odor and binding proteins are specifically localized into this sensory limb. They are also localized in other chemosensory part. I'm just giving an example here. And uh, they, they, they help the hydrophobic ligand, which is present outside in the air, in the environment, external environment, to fish out them and transport them into the hydrophilic system, which is the sensory limb, limb and deliver it at the site of odor and uh, olfactory receptor. Uh, now, these olfactory receptors later on get activated and results into different behavioral and physiological activity of the insect. So, if we in general take a survey of in the last decade uh, about the total order and binding protein uh, articles published, this is a rough estimate, like more than 60% of the articles are based on the recombinant expression and then the structural or the functional characterization of these proteins. So, this I precisely am telling you here because because uh, it is very very important to study uh, this OBP refolding, uh, which is a very important step in expressing this protein in in a recombinant ex uh, expression way. Now, if you in in the recombinant expression, mostly these proteins are expressed using a bacterial system, and in a bacterial system, as a, as we all know, it either a protein get expressed in a soluble or an insoluble form. OBPs are observed to be getting expressed mostly in an insoluble form and this results into an additional critical step which is called as protein refolding in vitro protein refolding and this step acts like a bottleneck for example if the protein refolding doesn't work successfully it will eventually lead to the falsely or misfolded protein which which is difficult to detect and not every time uh, detected easily and if it is not carefully understood then it might lead to the false uh, functional characterization or false structural characterization of it. So this loophole I understood when I was trying to do a literature survey for my PhD. And then I came across with this huge uh, um, uh, knowledge gap that, that is there right now. So uh, in, in support of my uh, uh, support, by, by the support of my supervisor, I decided to work on it. Uh, so the system that, that we chose here was uh, the, the odor and binding proteins of Helicorpa. Just, just to briefly explain, uh, tell about this this insect. It's a it's a highly polyphagous pest. It can feed on more than 120 different commercially important crops and has more than 50 different OBPs already been known and studied till now. So, uh, we did a initial transcriptomic analysis in which we tried to find out the expression profiles of different OBPs uh, expressed in this uh, in in this insect in different uh, at a site at site specific locations uh, like tissue specific or body part specific locations in that we can see that odor and binding uh, protein 5 uh, has a expression at male and female tarsus similarly obp2 has a symptom male and female tarsus, as well as GOBP2, which has high expression at male and female antennae. So we decided to choose these three OBPs. GOBP is already been studied very well. So it was like, like, a, like a control sort of protein with us. And OBP2 and OBP5 was, uh, are not 
are not a well studied protein there are some reports available on obp5 but but the, as as we all know the nomenclature system differs a little bit and the sequence is not not the exact here so uh, briefly explaining about the recombinant expression we we cloned this protein using a expression vector like pet 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 30a uh, into a bacterial cell called e coli abl21 d3 and we expressed it uh, uh, as as expected the expression was mostly in an insoluble form uh, we expressed it by uh, by tagging it with a six histidine tag which was like a fusion partner so that we can purify it later uh, post refolding so coming toward the core of this presentation which is the comparative refolding study so as i told you previously that uh, this there are there are different ways uh, protein refolding is is a bottleneck in this this overall recombinant expression of odor and binding protein and there are different methods available in literature that that are been widely used uh, one of the one of the most widely used and to some extent i'm 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 so i'm sorry to say this but to some extent blindly used is this redox method which was discovered in 1993 by prestwich et al um, and the the method uh, is based on a dilution uh, strategy so just to explain briefly what refolding does is you have to solubilize the inclusion bodies those are insoluble proteins that are expressed inside the bacterial cell using a chaotropic agent such as urea or a gonadine hydrochloride solution high, mol high molar urea or high molar gonadine hydrochloride solution and then eventually you remove the effect of chaotroph from the overall system by either diluting the concentration of of uh, uh, of uh, your of the of the of the keotrop or or by dialyzing it so that we can completely remove it so uh, as you can see the first method here normal dilution method is based on a dilution strategy dialysis method as as the name is dialysis method on column method is fairly a new method not uh, comparatively a new method uh, in which uh, you use a column uh, affinity uh, resin column uh, which basically helps the protein protein to bind it uh, selectively and the the cure drop gets washed away and that's how the refolding happens redox method which i told you is a is a very well used method for o, obp production uh, is a dilution based method and uh, I, I, I would just want to uh, focus here which is the acidification refolding method which was a novel method developed in our lab by us uh, is the fifth method and we 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 decided to compare our method with this remaining four method and to do a comparative analysis how does the obp refolding exactly work here so initially as we as as i told you the proteins are mostly expressed in uh, insoluble form inside the bacterial cell uh, post post the post harvest and extraction of these inclusion bodies we 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 did the refolding by five different methods for this all for all these three helicorpa proteins and as you can see here mostly the redox method which has been nomenclature as red and the acidification refolding method which has been nomenclature here as acr uh, were, were the best two methods uh, along with ndr which is the normal dilution method also the third best method so we decided to uh, take this as a uh, as first filter now this refolding efficiency initial refolding efficiency is nothing but when you refold the protein the chart might get which clearly tells that uh, which clearly tells that your refolding is not working so so this this refolding efficiency is initial efficiency of the pro method whether if the protein how much was the recovery of the protein whether some of the protein got precipitated out or whether all of them remain in the solution so still this is not the exact parameter to judge the method but still it was the first initial filter to filter out the uh, the dilution and the on column method which was clearly not good now uh, talking about what when we took ahead these three methods which is the uh, redox method acr method and the normal dilution method further but to further analyze them using a reverse phase hplc c8 column uh, as we can see here uh, now 
uh, refolding is is to uh, is to refolding is usually done to uh, make the protein functionally active and um, as these proteins are soluble proteins they have a hydrophilic core outside and a hydrophobic core inside hydrophilic surface outside and a hydrophobic core inside so if the refolding is not working the refolding there obviously the surface hydrophobicity of the protein is not going to be uniform it's going to be because it's going to be a misfolded protein and that will lead to the heterogeneous population of misfolded protein which will either be in a solubly aggregated form or in a in a all a, in or in a monomer form but but still having heterogeneous uh, hydrophobicities and that's what we exactly we are seeing here as you just to explain you one result as we can see the the sharp peak here represents a single uh, of pro refolded protein having uh, ha constant hydrophobicity, which because and why I'm saying this because they are eluting out at a at a very sharp single concentration of acetonitrile. Whereas all these big plateaus and this, this uh, big big uh, back broad peaks has has a ha heterogeneous hydrophobic population so this was exactly the uh, the case for even other proteins and uh, based on that we just did a uh, quantitative quantity analysis like how much of the protein had soluble aggregates or a heterogeneous hydrophobic population and a homogeneous uh, population or a monomer very uh, um, good very well refolded monomer and we can see that our method uh, refolding method has more uh, uh, success rate here as compared to other uh, refold uh, redox method or ndr method uh, later on we we uh, decided to purify these proteins uh, now as we as you can see the ndr was not working very well and it was shown by it was not seen by normal uh, recovery of the protein uh, analysis but by the first phase hplc analysis it was seen that the ndr is not working well so we decided to uh, uh, and we did uh purification using affinity tag and post affinity tag purification we did again the reverse phase hplc analysis this is very important which i want to point it out because most of the articles using refolding as a strategy neglect this point they just do the initial analysis of the refold but they 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 overlook or they neglect the analysis of the refolded protein after each important step so purification is an important step where protein get exposed to a different uh, uh behavior buffer uh, components, high salt concentrations, which which might act as the stress, and that will eventually affect the structure of the protein. And if there are soluble monomer, soluble aggregates, it's not going to be detected apart from by using this analytical techniques. So as you can see here, uh, even after purification, our method has least amount of aggregates, whereas the RED, which is the red uh, line here, has a high amount of aggregates. Same was the story for for. Uh, for obp5 but in in obp5 at the end our our method has higher aggregates which also tells that which is important here i'm i'm not claiming here that the method that we have developed is the best refolding method i'm just trying to put a comparative analysis and to tell that any method you use there is no universal method for protein refolding and that's why it is very important to keep track of the refold after after each important step same was what the case for gobp2 uh, uh later left. to just finally yeah later later to just finally uh, uh, come uh, analyze the success of the refold we did a disulfide mapping uh, experiment and and as uh, due to limitations of the time i'm not be able to go into details of it but i can just tell you that the uh, obp has three conserved cysteine uh disulfides uh like six conserved cysteine and three disulfides and uh, in in all three obps that we were working our method had all three disulfides formed whereas the other method that we were working that we were using here where did not had most of the disulfides form only one or two disulfides were formed which indicated in, uh, in result of soluble aggregation uh, then we did a, a ammonium sulfate precipitation which was a uh, which was an important step to remove the soluble aggregates and to specifically only uh, isolate the the soluble monomers uh, 
at the end we did uh, another important uh, novel uh, developed a novel method of based on reverse chemical ecology which was about functional characterization uh, in that uh, we found out that our r method uh, protein refolded by r method had different uh, uh, affinity for the for the ligands released by tomato plants whereas the whereas the obp refolded by redox method had uh different affinity for the ligands released by the tomato plant so uh it's it's I, i'm not be able to complete this into details but as i can I, the point that i want to put forward here is that protein refolding is a very very important step if we neglect this point it is going to eventually affect the functional characterization of the protein as well and that's what was the conclusion these were the final lag probable ligands that were identified to be as the uh, native ligands for these refolded obps uh, yeah uh, thank you i've just finished my phd and i'm looking for new opportunities thank you ali um yeah so um hopefully those opportunities will come your way um yeah. so you were you were breaking up a little bit unfortunately through through some of your presentation but i think hopefully everyone followed it okay yeah um do we have any questions for ani either from the attendees in the q and a um or in um from the panel <clears throat> Let's give everyone a second So I have one, I guess, um, right at the start, Ani, you mentioned that you had chosen to study um, the OBPs of Helicoverpa. And yeah. I just wondered whether there was a particular reason other than the fact that it is a pest and therefore that might be um, relevant. Was there anything in particular about the OBPs of Helicoverpa, though, that you thought made them a useful um, uh, model for your question? <laughs> well uh, first of all i had a good background about this insects uh, in my in my ma about this the chemosynthesis system of this insect in my masters research uh, in my master dissertation and i was fascinated to go into details of it i was already working on odor and receptors and gustatory receptor of this of this insect uh, back then in india and uh, then at that time i came across with this odor and binding proteins and um, and i i was really fascinated with the fact that they play such an important role in chemosynthesis system of the insect but but they are they are sort of neglected to be frank uh, as far as the molecular approach of uh, characterizing or studying them is concerned and that's why i decided to uh, to go into details of it uh, just why why helicorpa uh, one reason is that it's an important uh, pest and uh, it's important to characterize the overall system of this this pest and secondly i had a I had a major background about it so yeah that's yeah. yeah. do, do we have any other questions um, from the panel members or the attendees something in the q and a but it's related to another talk <clears throat> I think I think we don't have any other questions, Ani. So thank you very much for your presentation to us today. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to hand over to Wei now to host the next few speakers. Um, could I just ask again um, if a few of our panel members um, might be willing to turn their cameras on? It is really helpful to the speaker if they are able to see a few faces uh, in the audience. Um, so if, if if at all possible, we appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kara. So now we can keep going. And uh, so our next speaker is uh, Ping K. K. Uh, she is from Regional Center for Biotechnology in India. Uh, Good morning, uh, everyone. It's morning here. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity and to and for organizing such a wonderful meeting, having speakers uh, and participants from different continents. So while listening to uh, various talks, many of us have had the chance to grab our breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Although we enjoy a variety of tastes, uh, in our daily meals, but the salt taste is unique 
modality. Food without the salt is not as tasty as with the added salt. And some of us even like to add an extra pinch of salt to our food. Just like sweet substances, animals have an innate liking for salt as well. It is a powerful agent that enhances, enhances food intake in animals across the animal kingdom, causing behaviors like puddling of butterflies in urine patches um, to get the sodium and Mormon crickets cannibalizing each other uh, to get the sodium from there. And also during the period of reproduction in many animals, including humans, an increased need for sodium has been uh, also seen. So sodium is an important cation present in salt and animals cannot metabolically create sodium. Ingestion of this iron uh, from external food sources is required to carry out important functions like putting muscles into actions, preventing muscle cramps, or for maintaining the fluid or electrolyte balance, for the nerve transmission, or for nutrient absorption, and many more. So due to the availability of ready and processed food that contains high salt, our daily intake of salt is much more than expected, causing a huge burden on medical system throughout the world as higher consumption of salt leads to n number of diseases in humans which are highlighted here. And in that sense, fruit flies, Drosophila, are no different. They also like to binge on salt. And among taste receptors or the chemoreceptors, the role of PPKs and IRs in mediating salt response in Drosophila larvae and adult has already been shown. Additionally, the cellular basis of salt responses behaviors was, uh, was studied by silencing specific neurons where GR64F and IR94E neurons showed low curing properties and caused salt attraction, while GR66A and PPK23 mark glutaminergic neurons showed high salt properties and mediated salt aversion. Also, the role of GR2A in uh, pharyngeal taste neurons mediating aversion against the high salt has been documented too. These studies indicate that complex coding mechanisms to sense salt are separately mediated by labellum and the pharynx. All the, although the full repertoire of low and high salt sensors is still unexplored, but what remains Unclear is how high salt act on different taste neurons and circuits and modulate feeding behavior. To examine how, pre, uh, how dietary pre-exposure to high salt changes or alters subsequent feeding behavior, we started looking into the high salt feeding in flies. First, we asked how flies respond to different concentrations of salt. So our feeding assay suggested like many other labs, that for wild type flies, attraction or repulsion to salt is a taste dependent phenomena. We observed attraction at 50 millimolar concentration and as the concentration increased, flies show repulsive behavior. This pattern of feeding was also observed when mated males and females were tested differently, uh, separately. Our results suggest that female flies have higher preference for salt compared to male flies. And it is not surprising because it has been already shown that female Drosophila show strong craving for salt during reproduction, probably because mating changes the way sensory neurons respond to the salt, uh, salt taste. Next, we used an independent assay called Proboscis Extension Reflex Assay or PER to confirm our results that we got from feeding assays. After stimulation of tarsal or labellum tears of flies, flies again showed highest feeding responses at 50 millimolar in both the cases and aversive behavior toward high soil concentrations. We were curious to know whether exposing flies to high salt adulterated food for a couple of days can modify their preferences to high level of salts or not. For this, we put control flies under normal media conditions for three days and the test flies were fed on high salt media 
which had 200 millimolar NaCl mixed with the normal media. And followed by starvation of 24 hours, we tested these flies again for their uh, feeding behavior towards different concentration of the salt. These results uh, that we received were surprising because interestingly we found that the aversion towards high NACL was reduced and, and the flies became more attracted to high salt concentration after exposure to high salt diet for three days. However, this attraction was induced only starvation, under starvation, but not in the fed state. These results suggest that consumption of high salt can drive opposing behaviors modulated by internal state and shift the behavioral response from aversion to attraction, probably by enhancing the appetitive and suppressing the aversive pathways. To find out what salt, high salt do to other taste preferences, we tested sugars, bitters, bitter compounds, and other salt categories. Interestingly, we did not see any feeling changes when different bitter and uh, salt compounds were tested. But in case of sugar, we observed altered taste preferences for specific sugars, which are shown here, fructose, D-glucose, and lower concentration of sucrose. So all these sugars can be easily metabolized in the in the body and uh, what we see in case of sucrose is that because there is a receptor abundance for sucrose in flies it makes easy for flies to detect even lower concentration of sucrose we also observed that mated females consume more water after uh, feeding on different salt diets which is not shown here due to crunch of time but uh, compared to male flies female flies also consume more water to understand why do we see this enhanced preference for high salt concentration, selective sugars and water when flies were exposed to high salt diet, we looked into different category of taste neuron. So the first category of neurons that we tested uh, was the sweet neurons. For this, we tested feeding behavior of flies in the absence of neural activity in peripheral sweet neurons and we selected GR5A which ex shows expression only in the labellum taste neurons but nowhere else. To silence the activity of these neurons we used tetanus toxin. When GR5A flies were tested for their feeding, salt feeding behavior, interestingly we observed that switching off the neural activity in the labellum leads to higher salt responses for lower and high concentration of salt but no uh, and in case of controls uh, parental controls these flies just behave like wild type animals we did not see this increase when the flies were tested under fed conditions we next tested multiple sweet taste receptor neurons using receptors gr43a gr64a gr64e and f so all these receptors have a common phenomena that all of them show expression in the LSO. Otherwise, one of the receptors will be expressed in the labellum or in some other part of the pharynx or the uh, labellum neurons. So after knocking down the activity in all these receptors, what we found that none of these receptors showed an increase in the feeding responses that we have seen for GR5A at lower and higher concentration of uh, salt. But again, the parental controls behave like wild type animals. So what we observed rather that in, in each case, which is highlighted in yellow here, under normal conditions, the responses at 200 millimolar were actually quite higher even in the normal media conditions, suggesting that the aversion to high salt concentration was reduced. So this data suggests that there are certain neurons where the activity is important to regulate the salt intake. And first of all, we don't know if any one of these with neurons are salt sensitive to begin with. And if so, whether their salt sensitivity may be altered by lack of uh, neuronal activity. What the data suggests is that, that active functional LSO taste neurons are required for flies to exhibit high salt diet and hunger-induced tolerance for high salt. If 
if this is true, we looked further into many different set of neurons. And this time we looked at the bitter neurons, which are marked by GR33A. GR33A express in the labellum, but not in LSO and in some uh, neurons of the VCSO. Here again, just like GR5A, we found that these flies showed enhanced feeding responses in case of high soil concentrations, not for lower concentrations. Similar responses were observed for another receptor, GR93A, which expressed in VCSO, but not in LSO. In case of the third bitter receptor, which is GR66A, which expresses in almost all part of the pharynx and at the labellum, we did not see an increase uh, for 50 or 200 millimolar concentration, but rather we saw that the aversion towards high concentration was reduced. So what our results suggest that probably like many other taste, sweet taste receptors that we just saw, even GR66A neuronal activity is required for sensing high salt and absence of activity modulates uh, high salt intake under even normal media conditions. So all this data together emphasizes the requirement of active LSO neurons in altering feeding responses in hungry flies under salt-fed uh, condition. To understand if LSO neurons are actually sufficient in causing such a modulation, we next examine the role of pharyngeal LSO taste neurons specifically to test the feeding tolerance for high aversive levels of salt in flies. And for this, we use GR5A and Poxon gal for marked neurons, and we found that silencing LSO neurons specifically in flies leads to no increase in uh, salt uh, intake in both the cases, just like GR66A and uh, some other sweet taste neurons. So uh, what our data suggests that maybe the poxin neurons here, where we see a little lower response for 50 millimolar, and in case of GR62A, we saw an enhancement uh, on feeding, even under normal condition at uh, 200 millimolar, that these neurons mark some set of salt sensitive neurons, which show alteration in feeding behavior, even under normal media conditions. So all together, we studied the neural mechanism by which flies modify their acceptance of high salt as a function of diet, where mm -hmm. long term salt exposure increases taste sensitivity of LSO neurons and enhances salt, high salt intake. This modulation requires functional LSO neurons and a certain internal state. Multiple independent pathways and taste receptor neurons are involved in such a modulation and silencing or inhibiting one of these LSO neurons inhibits excessive salt intake causing partial reduction under starvation. So what our data support is that high dietary salt modulates and reshapes salt and other taste curves to promote overconsumption of food in flies. It remains unknown whether the pre-exposure to high salt diet modulate LSO neurons or the higher brain center areas mediating salt appetite. We are looking at the mechanistic details now. Uh, a recent receptor to ma uh, neuron map of pharyngeal taste neurons has been described, but, but the role of functional VCSO and DCSO neurons is still elusive. So overall, what we learned that flies can adapt to the amount of salt ingested over several days indicating the presence of a critical mechanism to reset the salt appetite and related neural circuits. Identification of new molecular sensors of salt and the related neural controls such as hormones, neuropeptides, and neurotransmitters may yield insight into the coordination of processes in the nervous system. So with this, I would like to end my presentation and I would like to thank my lab members, especially Shivam, who did major part of this study. I'm sorry I didn't show everything that we have covered in this story. Then my collaborators, my funding from Welcome Trust DBT and various people and Stock Center for providing us flies and RCB for the instrumentation facility. Thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Pinky. Wonderful talk. So let's see, any question from our participants and audience? 
just give a few seconds. Yeah, if, if I have a que very simple question, <laughs> I'm not a Drosophila uh, uh, researcher. So do you know the receptor for the salt? Yeah, we know there are sugar receptor, there are bitter receptor, there are CO2 receptor. So for the salt, do you know the receptor? I have characteristics B. It detects low and high concentrations of salt. Oh, okay. So that is the IR. Yes. So beside IR, do you have a chance to find other receptors related to the salt? So, uh, so GR2A was found in the pharyngeal neurons, LSO-pharyngeal neurons, to mediate the aversion towards high salt. But we still don't know if it is a receptor or if it is a modulator. Okay. Yes. And also, uh, you know, we, we need to look very carefully that all these Delphor lines that we have been testing, whether they really mark only that set of neurons or some other neurons which are recognizing, you know, sugars versus salt or something else. So if mm -hmm. there are extra set of neurons which are present and they may be salt sensitive neurons. Thanks. So any other questions? <laughs>